Fistman, uh, one of the co-organizers of this workshop. Uh, and uh, Jacques is gonna talk about acceleration opportunities for BFT consensus. Uh, and this is uh, again, a little bit of FGA <coughs> work, uh, but now at the application level. Uh, Jacques, your, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. So this is actually joint work with uh, with Manuel, who's uh, who's a postdoc at India Software, and uh, Mankit, who was uh, working with us as an intern, and in the meantime has um, has actually uh, left to uh, the City University of Hong Kong. So I haven't updated his affiliation, but uh, that's where he is. So this work is kind of um, in the context of, of this emerging use cases for for, for permission blockchains, uh, which we see which we see cropping up. And what uh, what is common in this use case is that uh, you know the blockchain is not used as a cryptocurrency. Uh, it is used for uh, kind of applications that traditionally are in the space of data management databases. So in these scenarios, actually, these blockchains don't require the expensive proof of work uh, type of consensus and can run on, on more traditional BFT uh, based consensus. And what this resulted in is in, a, in, let's say, an explosion or a renaissance of BFT research. Um, there is quite a few different papers coming out. Um, people are looking at, uh, you know, reducing different overheads and exploring different, um, let's say, trade offs. But one thing that we, what we kind of find interesting in this space, and, and we think it's worth uh, digging at a little bit, is that in many of these enterprise use cases, actually the, the participants in, in the blockchain have more control on the deployment of their system than what you would have in you know, traditional Bitcoin type of, uh, of uh, scenarios. So what happens is that there is many cases where the, the blockchain efforts are not actually uh, widely geodistributed, right? So there might be legal reasons why uh, they are maybe constrained to a region or a country. And the reality is that often uh, these blockchains are being deployed in cloud-based platforms. So we see, you know, Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft offering hosted uh, hosted blockchain solutions. And uh, there's also multi multi-cloud solutions popping up. So what this leads to is kind of uh, running these blockchains in, in what we call a data center-like environment, which is a little bit a misnomer because, uh, you know, we definitely don't think of these systems as being run inside a single cluster or something like this, uh, but uh, more of the presence of, uh, you know, hardware that you would expect in a data center. So in the cloud, I think 10 gigabit networking is kind of standard these days, but clearly 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit is coming. Um, as we heard in the talks before, there is a, a wide variety of uh, accelerators and kind of specialized hardware um, available to, to most cloud users. Um, as, uh, you know, as you might be aware, there is the infrastructure getting smarter. We have programmable switches, smart NICs, and um, especially in the cloud settings where the, the service providers have uh, you know, more control over what they're deploying, there's actually advanced OS features and whatnot that might be that one could use. So what this leads to is really um, to these exciting opportunities uh, to make distributed algorithms and, and in particular uh, BFT consensus faster by uh, you know, looking at how these different features um, could be beneficial. And uh, what we focus on in this talk is the uh, kind of the seminal work by, uh, by Castro and Lisco, which is PBFT. And I would just give you a, a short um, you know, reminder of how this works. So this is basically a leader based protocol that, uh, that advances in rounds. And the really relevant part uh, to this talk is that uh, it has several expensive all-to-all -all message exchanges, right? Um, and in the normal operation mode, as you see on the left, um, this will, this will introduce quite uh, some latency and, and some packet processing overhead. If there's failures, then the protocol goes into a, a basically a recovery mode where a new leader is elected, but for simplicity, I would, I would kind of uh, brush this to the side for the purpose of this talk. What also makes uh, PBFT and similar algorithms, similar protocols expensive is that um, much of the message exchanges has to be either uh, signed with a private key uh, based cryptography or um, the messages have to be authenticated with message authentication codes. So the latter you can think of as you know, using TLS channels between, between nodes. 
And traditionally, um, the leader uh, is the network bottleneck in these protocols. So clearly the leader has to do more work uh, than other nodes. Um, what is interesting is that if you see the network speeds increasing, actually, uh, even though the, the leader is still, uh, you know, the node with the most uh, network bandwidth usage, it might be non-trivial to actually saturate the network. Even in the leader. So the problem with BFT from a perspective of a programmer or a systems researcher is that it's a little bit like a, a dragon, which, uh, which has many claws and, uh, you know, many complexities uh, in the way um, it is uh, constructed, uh, especially the recovery and reconfiguration parts are, uh, you know, um, something that most people are, are, are afraid of, so to say, because it's easy to get it wrong. Now, what also happens if you start as a researcher and you know, start thinking of what parts can I accelerate or which uh, operations are a good uh, target for, for optimization, you find out that most of the existing works have hidden assumptions or, or couple optimizations together in a way that makes it hard to reason about, uh, let's say, the objective usefulness of different optimizations. So, you know, some of the works uh, will um, kind of by default think of the network always as being something very slow and low bandwidth. Uh, some of them might be uh, taking large latencies for granted and batching is, is almost universally used as a way of, of uh, amortizing, uh, for instance, cryptographic costs. So what our goal was with this work uh, is to try to quantify the benefits of different optimization strategies within the, same, within the framework of the same system. So for this, we implemented PBFT in Go, um, kind of taking it by the, you know, the protocol description. And uh, here I'm focusing on the, on the common case behavior uh, type of layout. Uh, we basically built uh, with, Go, with Go routines, a highly parallel and, uh, and parameterizable design. Uh, as you see, there's a software pipeline. So uh, as uh, messages arrive from the network, they are on Marshall. Um, and, and parsed in parallel. Uh, then there is again a data parallel step for hashing and verifying these messages. Um, the actual core of the protocol, the decision step, has to be uh, serial, so it goes in a single thread. But then again, for hashing and signing out the messages, um, you know, we can rely on, on multiple uh, threads to go in parallel. So if we take, this is kind of one node, and if we look at how this fits into the, to the larger picture, um, the way we, we think of this system in practice is that the client sends a request uh, for um, running the consensus protocol or ordering in the blockchain case to the leader node, uh, which will then run a consensus round across all the nodes. And uh, finally, uh, they will respond uh, to the client. If I plus one, uh, so at least one non-faulty replica replies to the client, then uh, the client knows that the message has been, um, you know, replicated and, uh, and is basically safe, so to say. So now, given this implementation and, and uh, given this kind of uh, general purpose pipeline, uh, we could simulate uh, different PBFT variants or different optimizations that people are considering within the same system. So the baseline, is we call it private key cryptography only. So here all messages are signed with a, with a private key and, and uh, verified with a public key. Then there is the case where uh, the messages uh, sent between the nodes are uh, only authenticated with Max. And this is in line with the optimizations that uh, for instance, PBFT already proposes uh, in its extended version, uh, but it's something that is very commonly uh, utilized in, in other protocols as well. And then we, we use a third option, which we call uh, domain optimized or blockchain domain optimized, where uh, we um, also the answers to the clients are sent not with a signature, but with a message authentication code. And basically the assumption is that uh, since in a, in a blockchain system, you can also uh, rely on blocks to, uh, let's say, gossip operations at the level of the blocks. Uh, if you uh, reach consensus on each individual transaction um, and then sign only the blocks, uh, then you can basically amortize that cost. In, uh, in addition to this, we are also uh, considering kind of the, what would be the effect if you would run a crypto, cryptographic accelerator, uh, because this is often the, the go-to thinking, right? So if you have a PBF or a BFT algorithm, um, the cryptographic acceleration is kind of the, the most obvious thing we could do. So to try out the effect of this in practice, we are running uh, 
this, uh, this implementation, either with uh, RSA 2048 or RSA 1024 uh, signatures. And uh, this gives us uh, kind of a um, simulated speed up of 4x on signing and, and 2.5x on, on verification. So by default, we use RSA 2048. And as I mentioned, uh, we are by default not considering batching in the system. So each uh, request, each um, operation uh, is, uh, is running a full uh, consensus run. So to explore the different uh, throughput, uh, levels that this uh, that this variant achieved. We deploy a 15 node uh, consensus group uh, with some number of clients on a on a local network. And what we see is that with uh, with signatures only, uh, the system behaves. Um, I mean, it has a very very low uh, throughput um, in the order of 1,000 operations per second. And of course, if we uh, replace uh, the signatures and the messages sent between the consensus nodes with uh, with message authentication codes, then uh, there is a significant bump in performance. And then, if one optimizes for the domain, so removes the signatures from the from the client uh, facing operations, uh, then performance suddenly uh, increases uh, significantly. And here we already see a difference in throughput for small and large messages, right? So for the first uh, two cases, actually there is no difference uh, in terms of, of, of message sizes because everybody is so compute bound. Now the question is, what would happen if we would apply uh, cryptographic accelerators? So maybe an FPJ or an ASIC that can offload some other cryptographic operations. Well, of course, when you go from the from the first uh, uh, variant to the second, you see a, a boost. But overall, um, what happens is actually removing the private key uh, cryptography or reducing the operations. Um, you know, will uh, give you a bigger boost than trying to accelerate it. I mean, in some sense, this is this is obvious, right? Because if you don't have to do an operation, it's faster than if you speed it up. Um, but uh, for us, this was an interesting result because it really uh, backed up this notion that optimizing for the domain uh, made most sense. Now, if you look at the cost of the operations within uh, within the leader node, so now we have domain optimized, um, you know, even using the, the cryptographic accelerator, uh, what you see is that if you break down how many clock cycles are, spe are spent in the different types of operations, uh, something like 75% of the clock cycles are spent on serialization and hashing. So uh, this is again, maybe not that surprising in the, along the lines of if you remove cryptographic operations, what remains is mostly uh, you know, parsing pa packets and, and hashing it. But I think, um, one wouldn't really expect that uh, that it is uh, to this extent important that it takes something like three quarters of the runtime just in these operations. And then, if you take batching into the account, here we're uh, plotting the good put as a function of uh, batching at the leader. So basically, uh, what we want to explore is how much. Uh, um, you know, the, the good put can be increased if the leader waits for a few client requests and then performs a single consensus round on four or eight or 16 of these requests. What we see is that uh, mm, as, we, as we increase the batching factor at the leader, we get uh, more network utilization, but overall we are not quite able to saturate and give it networking. Now, it might be that with a different implementation or different developers, uh, you might get, uh, you know, maybe get to 10, 10 gigabits, but it's clear that mm, nobody really knows how to get to 40 or 100 gigabit uh, unless you, you do some crazy amount of batching. So with this, I would like to, to wrap up and basically at the same time uh, talk about the two directions we think uh, we identify that are, are most um, promising in, in accelerating BFT consensus in this kind of settings. And uh, one is using SmartNICs. And uh, this is because you can offload the, the hashing and non-marshalling uh, quite uh, efficiently, and this is something where we actually we invite you to you know to reach out to us if you have a, a prototype platform which uh, you know offers some kind of uh, um, stateless or even stateful acceleration functions on the NIC because the code base is quite simple. Uh, the Go routines uh, separate functionality nicely into modules, and and we believe it should be fairly straightforward to basically do an apples to apples comparison. 
uh, between an old software and the, uh, and the smart incarcerated implementation. At the same time, we're also uh, looking at how we can use FPGAs. And uh, what Manu Kit is doing is uh, looking at the 10 qubit implementation and his angle on this is uh, at reducing latencies and uh, jitter. Um, but you know, a completely different question is how do we reach 100 gigabit uh, consensus uh, rate, right? So for that, we need probably a completely different design. Uh, and we, um, we think that uh, you know, part of the solution is kind of decoupling the common case behavior from reconfiguration, maybe even doing these two different tasks on, on different types of processes, right? So this is something where, again, uh, we have some thoughts, uh, we have some, some uh, starting ideas, but if uh, you know, this sounds interesting to you, then you should definitely uh, talk to us and maybe, um, maybe discuss this further. So with this, I'm, I'm done basically, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have uh, several minutes for questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question to Joel. Okay, so yes, okay. Marius, uh, let me unmute you. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So I have a question that has to do with the threat model and the failure model that you assume in this case. So, so before you, we just had software, software can fail, software can be malicious. The question is what happens now that you have acceleration and hardware in the mix? Do you, do you assume that you trust this part? Is it different? Is it separate? What's your thoughts on that? So that's actually a, that's a very good question. Uh, that is something that we, we've also been discussing a lot. So I think for, let me separate it into two parts. So uh, when, when you talk about smart mix, I think that's one aspect that, uh, that is really an open question. And this is, a, you know, like almost let me turn it around to the community and say like the people who work on smart mix, I think this is one of the unclear aspects often is what is, what is the trust model? You know, now you are basically mixing um, some kind of programmable, uh, programmable device with the, with the application. So I don't have answers, but I, I think this is, you know, an important question to consider. And if you want to make this actually happen at the level of the smart NIC, uh, we need to look at the, the OS features that we need to make sure that this is secure. It will not, it will not impact the actual behavior, right? So this is kind of orthogonal. Now, in the case of the FPJs, I think what is interesting is uh, actually looking at how we could uh, basically ensure that FPJs are only crash fault, uh, crash fault, right? So in some sense, implementing BFT consensus uh, could be done much faster if we didn't have to implement BFT consensus and could do CFT. Uh, and for that, we would need some mechanism of uh, basically treating these FPGAs as trusted, trusted execution environments. Um, again, there is a lot of work on that. I think the, the, the biggest challenge is at the moment is not so much at the level of the, the FPGA, but more the, the frameworks and the end-to-end -end kind of uh, uh, solutions for you know key management and uh, and all these things. I all think right, there's a talk. You. I think there's a talk tomorrow or in a few days on on Keystone at Eurosys, which is uh, you know they, it's like an open source trusted execution environment proposal, which I think might be an interesting thing to to combine again with uh, with this kind of FPGAs. Okay. 